Hello once again, this is Professor Mike Nugent and this is my lecture on Blue Ocean Strategy. This lecture is going to cover the first six chapters of the book. That's the only chapters that we are covering for class. Um, and I wanted to give you my some of my insights and opinions on Blue Ocean Strategy. There's also a complimentary set of lectures uh, in MP3 format on the Blackboard. And I'm also going to post a lecture from a professor from the San Diego University that did uh, also did a great presentation on the Blue Ocean Strategy. Just to give you many different points of view on this book. This book is a New York Times bestseller. It's been in uh, publication for at least 10 years. And I found it to be very inspiring and very um, instrumental for the way I think about products and the way um, people should think about or companies should think about how they redesign or make their products more useful for consumers. Okay. Now, Now this this piece, the value innovation, this may be similar to some stuff we that we talked about in the Kellogg strategy book. Um, now, what we want to do is, of course, remember in the Kellogg's book, we're talking benefits minus costs equal profits, and here we're trying to the same same basic topic: create buyer value. At the same time, hopefully reducing costs so we can create a zone called the uh, value innovation zone here oops uh, now we want to create a product or create an innovation or create a feature of an existing product that is going to affect be favorable to the overall costs of making that product and favorable to the overall value buyers are going to de derive from this. So there's no sense adding a benefit to a product if the costs of it are not going to be something consumers are willing to pay. Now, also when you look at a product, if you redesign it in a way that eliminates um, or reduces things that are not necessary or redundant or not used by customers, you can also help to lower costs dramatically without taking much benefits away. Now, the buyer value can be raised or created, or, uh, or the benefits can be enhanced um, by creating a new product or redesigning a product in a way that the industry has never offered it in some sort of new, innovative uh, modality. So, remember, the, the goal is to maximize profit. As we learned from the Zoom simulation, to maximize profits, you could have really two levers, increasing price or decreasing cost. Now, if you... Increased price, your car must have, um, or your product must have enough benefits to, to make it something worthwhile for consumers to purchase. Otherwise, you will, it will not be valuable. Okay. And as we've talked about in other aspects of lectures, especially barriers to entry, um, over time, costs will be further reduced as, you know, economies of scale kick in due to higher sales volumes, based on the product that's going to generate uh, a favorable response from cons consumers. Okay, so let's look at most people and most strategies written about the red ocean and most people can only conceive of this world where there's a red ocean. They don't really even know about the blue ocean. The red ocean is our day-to-day -day business strategy competing against other firms and think of a red ocean where it's the, the competition is so, fo uh, so fierce, say sharks fighting over you know, a handful of fish that the water becomes very bloody. And that's sort of my, how I see it. Now, and it's just too much competition and, and things are just sell too much as a commodity in this red ocean. That is really not a lot of um, area to make profit. So that the key features of the red ocean are that, you know, you compete in the existing market space. You're trying to beat the existing competition. You're trying to exploit the existing demand uh, for, for the product. You, you make a, a value cost trade-off where you, you reduce the value of your product in order to have lower costs. Um, and you try to live in this sort of low-cost, high-competitive world. And that's where most businesses and most business products compete. 
But there is a blue ocean for people who are open-minded, for people who are willing to be innovative and think outside of the box. And this blue ocean strategy um, creates new and uncontested market space where you're the only firm in operating this market space. And it makes all the competition irrelevant. Um, and it captures new demand that wasn't there before or that the other companies weren't utilizing. Uh, and it breaks that value cost trade-off by also by creating products that will reduce costs and increase value rather than reducing values to, in, to reduce costs. And the, the whole system of activities um, is a, there's a whole different mechanics of how it works. So the blue ocean is about opportunity, pioneering, innovation, and the red, op, red ocean is just competing the same old way that products have been competing with each other for, for years decades, centuries even. Okay, so before I get to the strategic to st strategic canvas, let me switch over and give you some ideas about some Blue Ocean products. Now, the TiVo, this is a Blue Ocean product. Uh, the TiVo was the first DVR. Before the TiVo, we had VCRs and we, have, we had DVD recorders, which were recording shows on discs, much like a VCR recorded shows on a tape. That the what was dominating the market at this point um, before TiVo was launched was VCRs or DVD recorders, um, a device like a VCR that used DVD discs to record TV shows on. And then came along TiVo, which was competing in a completely different space. It it revel it created a DVR where you could record shows. It created a friendly interface and a logical scheduler where you could record shows, play them back at any time. TiVo would go and you would tell the TV show that you liked. TiVo would go out, find that TV show, record it no matter when it was airing, if it changed times or channels, um, organized it, uh, made a user-friendly interface to select and record shows, and really innovated and created a whole new market space that TiVo uh, pioneered. So that was clearly a Blue Ocean product. Um, now, today, TiVo exists a little bit more in a red ocean as so much competition has developed. They haven't really been able to springboard their product, and that's the problem. Once you create a blue ocean, after so long, competitors are going to want to enter your market and start competing against you. So, and that happened with the TiVo. But in the beginning, it was definitely a blue ocean product. The uh, Apple iPhone, blue ocean product. It, when it came out, there was no other phone quite like it when it introduced its apps. You know, multiple features, camera, calendar, email, apps. I mean, other phones had some had similar features, but no phone created as much value as the iPhone did uh, when it was introduced and developed and has taken the industry and the market by storm. You know, they really created a Blue Ocean product here with, you know, the ease of operation, the interface, the, uh, the use of um, being able to purchase or download free apps and just the whole architecture of the iPhone is very blue ocean. Okay, this we've talked about in a class a few times, the single serve um, home brewing machine using the pods, the uh, lead brewing system, which is single cup brewing. Now this is a blue ocean product in the coffee world because in the coffee world, it was a traditional pot uh, brewers where you would get the, the, the grounds and the filter and you'd make, you know, you wouldn't just make one cup, you always make a few cups. Now, today's more sophisticated coffee drinking world where everybody in the family has a different flavor or particular brand of coffee they like, the solution that this company came up with these single serving pods of, you know, so there's less mess, less hassle. You pop the pot in and it makes the one exact one cup of coffee you want. Uh, reflecting the the realities of the new demographic where there's um, most people are brewing coffee for themselves at the particular time that they want it rather than the whole family waking up and all having breakfast together and one big pot of coffee is brewed so this was a blue ocean product and, and it swept the market as far as companies coming out with their own individual pods and the sales of these machines and the, the cost of these machines are not very expensive but they sell for 150 so there has to be extreme amount of value people are placing on this product to be selling it at such a high profit because the machine doesn't cost uh, much more than $35 to manufacture. So you could see that the profits are very high and it's because it's a blue ocean product. They're competing. They're not competing against uh, anybody else at the time that they developed this. 
Uh, also is true of the Dyson vacuum cleaner. When the Dyson vacuum cleaner came out, this was a Blue Ocean product. They, the uh, product, basically what the product did was it eliminated bag technology. You did not need to have a bag anymore. And it, inc and it increased and improved the suction capability of their Cyclone cylinder so that way the machine never lost suction. Now, they're selling this vacuum at $600, where a lot of vacuums at the time were being sold at, you know, $100, $150, because that was the going price of the vacuum. Now, these new Dyson vacuums, let's see. Okay, so the Dyson... Vacuum cleaner is clearly a blue ocean product because it created an extreme amount of value. A vacuum that actually held its suction continuously without losing, gradually losing its ability to, to create suction and was able to not have to have any type of replaceable bags, which were an extreme expense for most um, vacuum cleaner buyers. The way the vacuum cleaners used to work like today's printers. You buy a printer, it's relatively inexpensive, but you're paying a lot of money for the ink cartridges every so often. That's how vacuum cleaners were sold. Um, Dyson, when he developed this new vacuum, he brought it to Hoover's and they said, nah, it doesn't use bags. It's not profitable for us. We don't want it. And the, uh, the, the chairperson of Hoover's actually said that the biggest mistake that he made for his company was not buying this technology from Dyson and then shelving it and never using it because um, Dyson had to go and actually fund and create his own company himself and sell the vacuums and they were extremely popular and successful because it revolutionized a very boring product moved it to a space to compete in an area where uh, it was above and beyond all other vacuums based to its superior uh, design uh, and it was very profitable for the firm because it could sell it at a relatively high price because it had all these additional benefits with this particular model, they added a ball feature to make the maneuverability <clears throat> of the vacuum much more dynamic. Okay, the Nintendo Wii. This was another Blue Ocean product where um, I'll be talking about during the presentation when they were the first to include a motion control um, and they were the first to refocus the gaming industry away from um, 10 to 16 year old boys who wanted killing death and higher faster graphics to the whole family where everybody could be included from grandma to uh, granddaughter um, and grandpa to grandson and everybody in between as they created a series of games that were more family focused uh, and just inc included not just the die-car die uh, hobbyist type of gamers but included the whole family who just wanted to be recreationally uh, play games so another blue ocean product that had turned the um, video game industry around completely. So there's an example of five Blue Ocean products that um, that that I usually that I'm going to talk about and focus on during this lecture. Okay, now one of the tools that we use in, in the Blue Ocean is that the strategy canvas, where we look at we basically need to diagnose and understand. Uh, key factors of how products are competing in the marketplace. So we want to understand where the competition is, um, the factors that drive the industry, uh, you know, what factors the industry is using to compete on the product, product service, delivery. Um, so we created this chart here that can look at, this one's actually looking at um, the wine industry. And there's high price wine and low price wine. You know, the wine in the box and the higher price, more prestigious wine. So, you know, if you look at the different characteristics, um, the terminology used, price, the type of marketing, the age quality, the vineyard and the prestige and the legacy of the vineyard, the wine complexity and the, and the wine the range of wines being offered, you can see that there were definitely two different groups of very low end products that were wine in the box where you really didn't not worry about the vineyard or the age or the complexity and the very high-end wines you get, um, that are more specialized. Uh, so this 
canvas just laid out the, the factors and, and how companies competed in the wine industry as an example. Now, a four action framework is really a framework to say, okay, we have this strategic canvas that tells us what's happening right now for this industry. The four action framework is a process which we can go in and try to redesign or rethink how we can make um, remake the product. So if we're looking at a product, we want to say, what factors of the product can we reduce? If it's the dice, if it's the vacuum cleaner industry, we're thinking about um, re um, reducing, actually eliminating the bag. What if we go to this eliminate? What factors of um, which of the factors of the industry takes for granted should be eliminated, and that would be definitely the bags used in vacuum cleaners. Certain factors can be reduced in certain industries. If it's the Nintendo uh, Wii, we're looking at reducing the amount of money spent on expensive graphics chips to produce um, expensive graphics graphics on the in the video game. Create what factors can we create to increase? that's never been offered to increase the enhancement of the industry. For the Wii, it was the motion control um, controllers. Uh, for, uh, for the single serve pod coffee, it was, it was creating a device that could, could, that could perfectly brew one cup of coffee without any waste. Uh, raise, what factors can be raised above the industry standards? Um, if we looked at the TiVo, they raised the, the ability to search, seek out Seek out and search TV shows and record entire seasons uh, with one programming setup rather than multiple programming setups you would have in a VCR. So this four action framework looks for you to look at these four characteristics of any product to help uh, uh, design a new value curve for the product. So it's just a framework that any product, you can fit any product in there and try to reevaluate. Okay. Now, if we look at, um, here's a grid here. The, uh, let me just move the screen up a little bit. The eliminate, reduce, raise, or create grid. So this is sort of a grid that you create and you say, okay, and we're looking at the wine industry. We can eliminate the aging qualities, the complex terminology and distinctions, and the above the line marketing. We could raise the price versus the budget, budget wines, but still be coming lower than the expensive wines. And we can change, we could raise the retail store, the retail store involvement. I'll go over more specific, specifically how they did that later. They wanted to create an ease of drinking, ease of selection, and fun and adventure feel to the wine. And in this case, we're talking about yellowtail wine. And we want to reduce the complexity, the range, and the vineyard prestige. So this is what they came up when they redesigned the yellowtail, or the created yellowtail to compete in the wine space. And we'll talk more about that wine a little bit later. Okay, actually right now we'll talk about it. Okay, so let's just give an example using these tools I just went over. The um, highly competitive wine industry in the, in the United States. So what we have in the, in the United States is we have uh, um, premium wines with a massive amount of choice and then we have budget wines that uh, and boxed wines. So we really have the premium and the budget and a huge selection and choice when you walk into the wine store. There's some graphics for you. So we had the polarized strategy groups between premium and discount and really nothing in between. Now, the wine industry in the United States is the third largest in the world at 20 billion. Um, California makes 66% of the wine that we drink in the country. The rest come from these uh, five countries, actually six if you include Italy. And there was an exploding number of new wines and vineyards from Washington to New York. All right, so the customer base was pretty stagnant. The actual consumption of wine per person, the United States was 35th in the world. All right, so the wine industry, the top eight producers uh, uh, had 75% of the market and the 1,600 producers had the bottom 25%. And there's a million spent on marketing um, there was a severe price pressure developing and the dominant growth strategy was towards more of the premium wines by adding more complexity, better image, more prestigious vineyards, number of medals won at festivals is how they were trying to compete and raise prices in the wine industry. So that's just how it was. So for the, uh, the high end product, 
we had a high level for the high price product. We have a high level of all the features, including price in the industry. And that's the wine <clears throat> strategic canvas for that high priced wine and the discount wine. Um, had a low level of most features um, and a normal level, I guess, of complexity or distinction. So those are the two existing competitors in the wine industry. So what people said, what generally, when you when they asked a lot of Americans who weren't about wine, a lot of people said, too confusing and too complex. Give me a beer any day over wine. Um, the, the terminology, the descriptions, the shopping experience, all was overwhelming for most people who had truly no idea what to buy or, or where to go or what was a good wine. So it was a lot, of, it was very intimidating to bring new customers into the market based on how it was the complexity that was already set up. So Yellowtail uh, created a blue ocean in the wine market by filling the void between the budget and the premium wine by creating a more moderate wine in between. So there, this is the Yellowtail uh, product right here. And, you know, initially only two types of wine that made the wine a lot easier to select with only two choices and made the, the, the wine a little bit more agreeable to a, a, someone, a, a palate of someone who's not very familiar with wine by making it a little bit sweet, a little bit more fruity. Use the same bottle for white and red wine, which lowered the costs on procuring the bottle and the bottling costs, which was unheard of at the time to use the same type of bottle for these two different wines. Uh, the variant, simple, but uh, package was the variants were um, just really in color. Use a kangaroo as a as a as a symbol, trying to make the wine less intimidating, um, and wanted to sell the essence of Australia. And they were trying to promote the wine by giving involving retail staff in providing them Australian-based clothing and and giving them. Uh, Promotions, if they would promote and sell the wine within their store, uh, giving them some incentives and, and trying to give them a wine that they could easily promote and explain to customers who knew nothing about wine. Okay, so that was the Yellowtail strategy. Um, so it eliminated all the confusing uh, terminology, aging, vineyards, and, and things of that. Uh, well, didn't eliminate the vineyard, but and above the line marketing, it reduced the wine complexity and the, the, the different selections of wines in the vineyard prestige, but it raised the price versus the budget wine. So it wasn't, you know, a low quality product. It was important to have a price point that didn't say it was just a cheap boxed or jug of wine. Uh, and they want to raise the simplicity of which the store sold the wine and increase the enthusiasm of the salespeople and create easy drinking, ease of selection and create some sort of sense of fun or adventure in the product. And if you draw our strategic canvas for their new wine that they created, they lowered these features um, that we had just talked about, lower than importance than the, the, the two existing competitors, uh, types of competitors, the high end and low end. But they, they wanted to increase the ease of drinking the ease of selection, the fun and adventure, but have a price point that was sort of in between the two. So that was how they created uh, a product that was competing at a whole different level. Now, the end result that Yellowtail had uh, phenomenal sales success and had a phenomenal acceptance in the market and really um, put turned the market around and competed at a whole different level, which turned out to be extremely successful for this company. Okay, so there are three characteristics of a good strategy. The strategy is focused, divergent, and has a compelling tagline. So um, we'll get we'll talk about this again. Now, so the results, as I was talking about, Yellowtail became the number one imported wine, outs outselling all the wines from France and Italy, the fastest growing imported wine in the history of the United States. It brought new customers to the wine market. Uh, some of the, the boxed and jug drinkers traded up and the premium uh, wine drinkers traded down. So the industry criticized them tremendously at first, but they didn't care because the customers understood what they were doing. Um, and they were able to, you know, really show that they had a quality wine that was at an attractive price and really focused on what consumers were looking for in the American market. 
All right. So in the summary, uh, industry conditions are given. Industry conditions are reshaped or can be shaped. That's the blue ocean versus the red ocean logic. Strategic focus, build competitive advantages to beat the competition. Vary Kellogg's. You notice how the Kellogg's is, has a, a dust jacket that's red? Because the Kellogg's book is more conventional red ocean type of strategic marketing. And the blue ocean book, of course, has a blue cover. And they're focused more on creating a quantum leap in buyer value to dominate demand. Sort of when the TiVo was created, it was a quantum leap above the VCR as far as um, uh, features and dominating um, the current technology. In the red ocean, we want to uh, retain and expand the customer base through further segmentation and customization of the product and embrace, uh, in terms of trying to embrace different customer types. In, in the blue ocean, we're trying to go for the mass of buyers, the mass market of buyers, um, willing to let some customers go, but thinking in terms of the key value of the commodity that uh, the customers are really looking for. All right. If we talk about assets and capabilities, um, we think in terms of the company's existing assets and capabilities uh, built on what it already has. In the blue ocean, um, we want to be a little bit open-minded, a little bit more free-thinking. Um, and be free from you know the existing assets and capabilities and add, and sort of develop new ones more aggressively okay so product servings and offers, offerings um, think in terms of um, what's currently done in industry and just look to uh, maximize the value of these current offerings of the different products and services nothing revolutionary and the blue ocean though um, we want to transcend the industry we want to develop and solve um, the buyer's major problems or bottlenecks. Um, we want to create a product that just solves all the existing products with the current the current product and moves us into a whole new territory. Okay. So we were talking about this four action framework. I just want to go back to that again. It's important that you know whatever product we're looking at. You now there's a Every product is there to solve a particular want or need for a customer. So starting with the, exi the existing products, none of them are, you have to think that the existing products are not perfect. There's always some, uh, there's always some factors that we should increase. There are always some factors that we could eliminate uh, or reduce, and there's always some things that we could create new, all to create additional benefits and value for the for the customer and at the same time helping us reduce our costs on the product. So it's sort of a, a dual goal here. Create something valuable, overly valuable and increase the benefits of a product while doing it in such a way that's so smart that we're actually also reducing the complexity of the cost of the product. Okay, now moving into chapter three, uh, reconstructing market boundaries. So our common tendency in the red ocean um, is just focusing on the existing customers who who are traditionally been your customers and who buys your products on a routine basis. Um, looking at um, you know the same way of uh, that of influencing the same people and the same patterns of buying products, you know. Um, It's just accepting everything that's already there and how the industry competes and, and just continually moving that forward without any innovation or any develop. You know, focusing on the same issues, the same sales distribution, the same customers, and really just working with what's there. That's the common tendencies in the market boundaries of who your customers are. Now, to reconstruct these market boundaries, you know, when the blue ocean, we want to look across different industries, you know, and say, can we make a product that, that would uh, attract buyers in this industry away from the traditional industry? You know, look across the different strategic groups um, or complementary products or services where this could fit into. 
um, um, we're talking about the emotional functional orientation of the product can we sell it on a different emotional stance all products all advertising and products are sold through an emotional point of view safety family excitement sex different things can we can we change the current part the current um, emotional tendencies that we try to sell the product into something different and then look across time as far as if time's an element element of the product how could we sell it in a different time implement you know you know instead of instead of um, if you look at those timeshares for vacation vacation homes that's a whole different way of looking across time or the time involvement in the product okay so if we look across the industry um, if you look at movie theaters or cinemas and restaurants, those are different industries but have the same purpose, which is um, entertainment. Now, there are alternatives, not necessarily substitutes, because you could do actually do both in one night. Now, a substitute, I guess, for going to the movies would be a video rental. In this day and age, we call it a red box. Um, so some examples are... There's a there's a private company called NetJets, private jet versus airline travel. So here, owning your own private jet is just too expensive for most of us. Um, but selling a portion of a private jet to multiple different users, where instead of one person owning the private jet, you could have 16 to 25 different people owning the private jet, and then sort of like a timeshare, you book when you're going to use it, and save the time of all the maintenance and storage of you know, having your own private jet. I mean, that's a little bit, not too many people can relate to, relate to that example. But, um, you know, so if we could, if we could look at um, the different industries, we may be able to capture some customers away from other industries that um, aren't direct competitors. And we'll get back to that a little bit later. All right, so if we look across strategic groups, uh, within an industry, you could have, you know, there's the BMW, people who will buy a more premium car versus a, a less premium car, fitness club goers versus people who work at, out at home. You know, so the example was, if, if we're looking across these strategic groups, how do we get the people who generally feel more comfortable working at home to come to a vit fitness club? The Blue Ocean product there was this place called Curves. Which, which basically said, okay, um, how can we focus on creating a health club for people who prefer to work out at home, which thereby attracting new, new customers? If you're just going to make the same existing health club, you're going to compete with all the other health clubs around for those people who want to work out outside the house. But Curves created something where um, people who typically prefer to work, at home, work out at home would now be coming to a club. So... Now, what focus primarily on women to trade up from working out at home to going to a fitness club. Um, the complaint of these customers, it was too difficult to get motivated at home, too many distractions, so they wanted to trade up to a fitness club. But they found them too time, too time consuming, too costly, not enough privacy, uh, especially um, if you're working out with both sexes. Uh, so Curves fixed that by creating a women only club which increased the privacy simple equipment that was focused in a circuit so that offered group motivation and convenience and affordability I mean I've never been to a curves but this is sort of how what they do to create a whole new gym experience to create a whole new space to focus on that strategic group and became very successful by attracting customers outside the normal fitness club market okay so if you look across the chain of buyers, how products are typically sold, um, it depends on you know who is who is typically purchasing. So in a, in the drug market for long term, that was the um, the doctors uh, who were purchasing the drugs and dispensing the in the pharmacies, but uh, what they had done at one point rather than having the pharmacies and the doctors really um, decide what drugs they're going to buy and prescribe, the, the, the medical industries said, 
let's sell directly, well, let's advertise directly to people for the medications through TV. And that's why we have all these TV commercials now to focus on different types of drugs that you could ask your doctor for rather than your doctor deciding for you. Um, now, another example is the Bloomberg Terminals. They, uh, before Bloomberg, the industry focused on the IT managers and what the IT managers wanted to buy for their traders. Bloomberg, when they developed these terminals, they instead focused on the traders and they made terminals that had more features and functionalities and the system, including personal items that traders would want. So they decided to go straight to the traders who then in turn demanded from their IT managers that they buy Bloomberg terminals. Uh, so thereby sort of changing the paradigm and going th through to a different um, customer going get trying to get the actual sale to a different customer group than previously how things were being sold and remember the uh, traders are the ones who make or break the business and their needs are paramount that's what some of these terminals forgot the IT people had a different need to try to buy a system that was easier for them to install and network and, and, and implement uh, but not necessarily the best product for the trader so Bloomberg was made sure the trader knew that their product was the best for them and thereby they forced IT managers to buy them. Um, if we talk about complementary products, uh, you know, say for example, parents who have young kids and, and many of you may be in this situation and you'd like to go to the movies or you'd like to go out to the fitness club, but it's too expensive um, to get a babysitter to go out and do these things on a, a, on a high frequency. So what they did, what many of these first pioneering companies did, which they, they don't do this too much in the United States here, but movie theaters that provided a, a babysitter for two hours or a fitness club that had a childcare center so you could work out and your, and your children will be watched at the time that you work out. So this opened up a whole new market of stay at home mom and dads with young children or working mom and dads that come in, come home after work and have young children, but still want to go out and work out. Now they can go to the gym. The kids can be brought to the kids um, area where they're they're attended to, and then the parents can work out. So that increased the whole a whole new selection. And you know, if you're thinking about a parent, it could cost you know easily cost anywhere from twenty to forty dollars to have a babysitter, depending on how many hours. So if you go to the gym three or four times a week, the money you're saving in babysitting costs. Uh, definitely pays for the membership okay okay so with uh, complementary products another example is computers and software if you don't have the software you know it's not going to make the computer as valuable it's also what one of the reasons the iPhone became so valuable is that it had the complementary product of apps the apps were so useful and so revolutionary that it helped really drive the, pat, the 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 value of the iPhone 4 or 3 or the original, you know what I'm saying. Okay. Um, if we talk about uh, functional or emotional appeal, products are basically sold on emotion. So Swatch came up with the Swatch Watch and sold it um, not so much on how valuable the, the, the watch was on be, being gold or silver or diamonds in it, but more as a fashion accessory. Um, the Actually, there is a, I know the book talks about this uh, cement company that used to sell on the functionality of the cement, but then turned it into the emotional sale of you can start to build a house for yourself uh, and things of that nature. So, you know, selling, um, switching away from difficult, different types of emotional connections to a product and trying to strike a chord through originating it um, or trying to f get people to understand how this product could fulfill a different emotional need is a key way of selling products as well. And, and things, um, you know, for example, uh, in Japan, they had a, a barber shop where they wanted to apply to the emotional appeal of being efficient um, because the uh, according to the, the uh, Blue Ocean book going to a, I've never been to one going to a Japanese barbershop there was tons of rituals and treatments and 
you know, it took a really long time. So they came up with these new types of barber shops that appealed to the being fast, inexpensive, and, you know, efficient types of haircut. Also, if you look at Jiffy Lube, before Jiffy Lube came out, um, the ordeal of bringing your car into the mechanic, leaving it there or waiting hours at a time just to have your oil changed, uh, they, again, sold the idea of Jiffy Lube, even though it costs more to get your oil changed there, on the idea of it being um, a quicker process, a fun, a funner process where you can actually watch them change your oil and come into their waiting room and they had magazines and, you know, just, you know, the appeal of the the efficiency of that process versa and the standardization of the process by including, you know, you come into Jiffy Lube and we will vacuum your car, we'll wash your windows, we'll test your 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 air pressure. You can watch us do it all and all for free with every oil change, you know, so that's sort of an example. Okay. Looking across time, uh, here we're trying to predict, um, envision where the trend of tomorrow's value can be realized today. So, you know, for example, if if you look at a company like Apple, when they when they were in the world before they came out with iTunes, it was a world of illegal downloading confusion, lack of quality. So they decided to uh, go a different path. So they created the uh, iTunes as a complementary product to the iPad, but they wanted to, um, you know, establish a payable and reliable uh, legal download versus the illegal downloading of the time. So they their new strategic canvas included paying for better quality, ease of selection, uh, standardization of you know naming of the of the of the songs and placement in an organized fashion they just really reinvented that whole industry um, compared to what it was at a particular point All right. okay in this slide we're going to look at the difference between the head-to-head -head competition versus blue ocean uh, creation okay so if we looked at you know certain boundaries of the competition in the industry, it focuses on rivals within the industry, head-to-head -head competition. What is our competitors doing, and how are we going to fight against that? Um, in the blue ocean, we look across to alternative industries. Where can we um, exist outside this this tight red ocean? Where can we create additional value um, into new market space? On the strategic group, it focuses on the competitive positions within each strategic group inside of the comp inside of the industry. Um, Blue Ocean looks to looks across the strategic groups to sort of make a product that could satisfy all of them within the industry, not just um, dividing, conquering, but making a product that's so universal that can that can be work with all these strategic groups. And the buyer group it focuses on serving, better serving the existing buyer group. In the blue ocean, it looks to say, okay, can we find a different buyer? So instead of focusing on, you know, the people we're traditionally selling to, let's look at the people really using the product and try to sell to them directly. Um, okay, the scope of products and services offered that focuses on maximizing the current uh, features and services uh, that the industry is bound by. With the Blue Ocean looks to how can we make a product that goes beyond the current industry um, and just can offer a new set of benefits and, and services and features of the product that would attract a whole new set of customers. Uh, in the emotional orientation industry, it focuses on the current functional emotional orientation of the industry, whether that may be. The Blue Ocean says, let's rethink this. Is there a different way that we could focus on uh, different emotional aspects of, of this industry? Okay. If we look at time or trends, focuses on adapting the external trends as they are evident today 
And the blue ocean says, let's participate in shaping new trends over time, a, a new time or trend dynamic to sell our product. All right, moving into chapter four, we're going to focus on the big picture, not the numbers. So we don't want to get tied down in short term quarterly thinking. We want to think big, longer term, bigger picture, where these eventual changes can expand the business greatly. So we have these steps in this visual awakening, sort of opening up people's minds and um, understanding where you are before, you, um, before deciding where you're going to go. Okay, so we have these four steps of the visualization strategy, which is another framework for Blue Ocean. So we're going to build upon these, the six paths of creating um, this Blue Ocean. So the four steps in the visual awakening, one is the visual awakening, where we need to um, compare our businesses with competitors by drawing that strategic canvas to see where we fit and what the strategies are at play. Um, the virtual exploration is really uh, exploring the different paths to blue oceans, uh, the different avenues to new customers, distinctions, uh, advan distinct advantages um, of our that we could make if we had alternative products or services. Uh, what factors could we eliminate, create, or change in our in our products or services today? The visual strategic fair, which would be drawing the strategic canvases, placing our insights on redesigning our product and where it would fit within the canvas, getting feedback from alternative ideas from other um, canvases, from other customers, competitors, things of that nature, using feedback to um, uh, build the future strategy. <coughs> and then basically communicating the differences between the before and after of these new strategies, comparing it and letting everybody in your organization know these new operational uh, imperatives that are going um, to try to help us achieve the strategy. Okay. All right, so here is a, um, a pioneer. So we actually, um, we call a PMS map where we're looking at settlers. Uh, migrators and pioneers. So what we're trying to do here is look at the industry today. So in today's industry, we're going to plot, you know, the, the current, um, so in this map, we basically look at today's uh, business segments or products and we can map them by, you know, um, there, we want to put them on the map to say, you know, the pioneers would definitely be an area where we have high growth, uh, high cash flow, and then moving downward from uh, the migrators to the settlers as the growth of the, the product sales and the profits are slowing. And what we want to do with this map is just get an idea of where we sit with all our different offerings and then start to plan out where we want each one of these to move to uh, in the future, where some, some industries or some products or services, we're going to know we just really can't do much with these. They're going to remain settlers. Some of them we can actually start to make strategic changes to, to expand the growth and profitability and move them into the, the mitigators or hopefully move more into the pioneering segment. So this is really just a little chart to kind of plot where we are and where we'd like to be for each of our um, you know, business segments. Okay. Chapter five, reaching beyond existing demand. So how do we um, avoid the mistakes of focusing only on the existing customers and trying to accommodate them by making finer segmentation? You know, um, we want to think, how can we convert non-customers to customers? How can we make a commonality in our experiences that's going to attract all sorts of customers? And how can we eliminate the segmentation um, and desegment the market to make create a, really a product that's going to work across all segments. Now we have this. Um, oops, going backwards there. I'm trying to move this up. We have these three tiers of non-customers. The first tier are there. They're not our customers. They're not buying from us. But the first tier, they're the closest to my market. They purchase only out of necessity. 
but mentally they're not really a customer, although occasionally they may have bought our product. The second tier, um, they refuse the industry's offering, offerings. They don't buy the product at all. The third tier is farthest away from our market. They've never even considered um, our products as an offering at all. So hopefully by focusing on some commonalities across these non-competitor uh, or customer sorry, non-customer tiers, we may be able to develop a product that can get in new customers and pull them into our market. So here's a visual of the three tiers of non-customers. Here's our market here where we sell our products. So our first tier, they're mentally not customers, but they have purchased before. The second tier, um, you know, in the second tier, they just refuse the industry's offerings and choose a different example. In the third tier, they have no idea about the industry at all and, and any of the products we're be able, being able to offer. Now, in the first tier, and if we look at this British fast food train, you can see a few of these um, in the city. Uh, they found that the customer had some commonalities. They wanted to have a lunch that was quick to fit within. Now, some companies are having only 45 minute or 30 minute lunch periods. They wanted to have the lunch had to be fresh healthy and reasonably priced. So they didn't want to go fast food, Taco Bell, you know, um, Burger King, KFC. They felt that, that was the food wasn't that fresh. It was very unhealthy. Uh, although it was reasonably priced, they wanted something that would fit all four areas. So many professionals, they like to go out for lunch just to get out of the office and, you know, maybe go to lunch with some coworkers. But going to lunch every day is too pricey to go to a, a restaurant for lunch. And it takes a lot of time to be sit down and have a uh, have a waitress or waiter. And, you know, it just wasn't fitting the mold of what professionals needed. So this company focused on the commonalities. People wanted to go out for lunch. They wanted it to be healthy and fresh, reasonably priced. And they were able to make uh, a store that focused on freshly daily created sandwiches, um, an easier way to pay and select your 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 sandwich um, and create some new more health oriented focus on the food um, some of the differences people like to sit down and to be served some like hot food uh, some like a custom order but they didn't focus on these differences they focused on the similarities so instead of focusing on these differences and trying to trying to create a situation where ever, all these differences were met they just really found what people wanted the most and the commonalities between what everybody said that they wanted a lunch to be efficient, they wanted it to be fresh, they wanted it to be healthy, and they wanted it to be reasonable price. So they focused on what everybody wanted in the commonality and not all the little petty differences everybody had about what exactly they wanted. And they were able to make a very successful um, offer to the people who wanted to go out to lunch and just may never have tried them. Okay. The second tier, just customers who refuse, do, do not um, want the product. So an example could be, um, you know, furniture ads. These are the billboards, sort of on on where you would sit near a bus station or you know a bench, and they would have these ads, and. Um, A lot of a lot of advertisers, a lot of people who advertised felt that billboards were just too expensive and that they just were were not in a good enough position to get their message across. So they refused to use you know these at all. So the solution was a company installed and wanted to maintain these benches for municipalities. So they came in and they said, "Listen, we're going to buy all these different benches and put it around the town, around the bus areas for people to sit on." And we're going to do this all for free, but we want to, in return, we want to get the right to advertise on the bench uh, of, of of these benches around. So what they had was a higher traffic and lower cost. So many non-customers to this sort of outdoor advertising market liked the idea. And um, they're able to bring in a bunch of customers who had never considered advertising their products in an outdoor fashion. Something similar to this is also putting advertisements on buses as they drive by, which actually a lot of colleges and universities are very um, are heavy advertisers on those moving buses. The third tier, the non-customers, um, they just ne um, never even thought of it as a potential 
um, something they just never thought as a product that they would ever be involved in. One example is uh, tooth whitening products. Before Crest came out with their tooth whitening strips, it was a very expensive treatment by dentists. Um, there really were no alternatives. You had to go to a dentist, and it was just really an expensive proposition. Um, and then when Crest came out with these self-at-home whitening strips, it really opened up the market to people who wanted to have whiter teeth, but just didn't want to go to the dentist to achieve that. Uh, and this market later expanded to these. Now they have these laser centers in the mall where you could go into the mall and get the teeth whitening done at the mall. Um, and the market exploded for this area. All right. So catchment. What is this phrase, catchment? Um, it's basically trying to throw out a net and catch as many customers as possible with one solution. So you want to identify the commonalities that people have for the product and use that to enable the largest catchment of as many customers as possible. So you don't want to focus on the differences. You want to focus on what everybody has in common. Um, now, Okay, so if you get a product like the cell phone, that really trans, that was something everybody wanted to have mobile phoning. You know, people had a lot of other distinctions of what they wanted in a mobile phone, but just the fact that you're able to produce a mobile phone was able to garner a huge amount of customers that um, everybody had the commonality of wanting to have that mobility. Yeah. Okay, Okay. chapter six, our last chapter we're going to go over, um, getting the sequence the strategic sequence right. Okay, so um, if just having a great idea isn't always enough to make it commercially viable, meaning that we're going to be able to sell it. So we have to look at, you know, in the strategy, a few things, the buyer utility, the price, the cost, and the adoption. So here's the sequence, you know, so we start with the buyer utility. Is there an exceptional buyer utility in your business idea? You know, so sort of like the TiVo had exceptional buyer utility. If there isn't, you got to rethink your idea. If you find that the your there's a lot of buyer utility, meaning that the buyer is going to find a good amount of usefulness to your product, then you can move to the next level, which is price. Is your price easily accessible to the masses of buyers? Can the mass market afford your price? If they can't, you got to you got to rethink the price of the product. You know, so if you can set a price that your market will put you at the largest um, side of the market customers, then you can look at your cost. Can you obtain a cost target to profit from uh, at your strategic price? So you pick a price point that's going to work best for your product, and then you see if you could make it at a cost point that that, that could produce, a, at that price could produce a, a decent profit. If no, you're going to have to rethink the whole process. If yes, then you have to think about, you can move to the adoption phase. phase. So what are the hurdles to actually getting your business to market? And how can you address them up front and get your product to be adopted and sold commercially viable? And if that's true, if you get all four of these done, then you have a product that can move to, you know, a viable blue ocean idea that can move to the market and revolutionize the way people think about that particular product or service that you're involved in. Now, utility, utility and technology are not the same. Utility uh, goes back to, um, how the customer uses the product in many different stages or, or formats. And there's different what we call levers of the utility that customers um, are going to focus on when they buy your product. So you can create actually a utility map to say, you know, the six stages of buyer utility, first stage is the purchase. How is the purchase done? Is the purchase done in a way that's inconvenient or just too complex? Sort of like the tooth whitening before the Crest whitening strips or the at-home whitening kits, you would really have to go to the dentist and the complexity of setting that up. And it just really was not a great thing for most people to, to buy teeth whitening at the dentist because most people hate going to the dentist, but people don't mind going to the supermarket and picking up Crest white strips. The delivery, how does the product get to you? Dell had a revolutionary delivery of their uh, their their PCs where you were able to design them online and they would be delivered to you directly to your house through mail. Um, the use of the product, how easy is it to use? Supplements, are there 
sufficient supplements or complementary products to work with your product. The maintenance, how difficult is it to maintain your product um, to keep it functioning efficiently? And disposal, is there an extra cost to disposing your product? Is it a hassle to get rid of your product? You know, some products you can't just throw out in the garbage. You know, it, it could be a real hassle to figure out how to dispose of it. Okay. So some of the questions you want to ask in these different uh, buyer experience that we were just talking about, you know, um, how long does it take um, to find the product you need on the purchase? Uh, where are you buying the product? Where is the place? Is it accessible, convenient? Uh, how secure the transaction and how rapidly can you make the purchase? Delivery, how long does it take to get the product? Is it difficult um, to unpack or install the product? Uh, the use, do you need a lot of training or expertise? Are there complex directions or instructions? If you look at the success of the iPad, the ease of use is incredible for a device uh, that has so much functionality in it. The supplements are do you need other products or services to work with this product? It, at one time, it was revolutionary to think of putting batteries in with the product, you know, and that was a supplement that most people found, hey, you could simply really increase the, the, the customer experience by giving the, the batteries the products they could use it right away, you know, and then how costly are the supplements? Um, how much time do they take? Are they are easy to obtain? One of the big complaints about the uh, Apple products is that the supplements are very expensive. If you look at the new iPad 2 when they came out, they had a $40 uh, cover on it that was designed magnetically to go over the iPad and to be useful. And it really, for what you were paying, it, the utility most people found wasn't that great. In fact, most people don't use those covers. They quickly discard them and buy a separate cover for their iPad. The maintenance, what does it take to maintain the product, to upgrade it, you know, uh, how costly is the maintenance of the product, and disposable. If you think about computers, it can be kind of technical and a little difficult to upgrade your computer, add new memory, add new video cards, and also now it's going to get increasingly more difficult to dispose of the computers as landfills fill up and the worry of lead and other uh, dangerous components in the, in the computers are more focused upon. Okay, so if you're looking at Okay, so the goal, the overall goal is to uncover anywhere where these, the utility is um, blocked for the customer. We want to we wanna kind of really, our goal is to uncover a, these utility blocks and improve the process. Um, so in each of the different stages, we want to see what are the biggest blocks to, you know, the customer productivity, simplicity, convenience, the risk. Uh, the fun in the image, the environmental friendliness. So in each of these different areas, purchase, uh, delivery, purchase, delivery, use, supplements, maintenance, disposable, we want to look at each of these uh, different facets of the utility. Customer productivity, simplicity, convenience, risk, fun in image, and environmental friendliness. So in every aspect of the, of the utility, we want to make sure that um, these, 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 six potential blocks to the utility are thought about and improved in some way. So when we think about pricing, uh, the price must be attractive to the majority, the large catchment of users. And the price must also be in a way that we can make a profit. Um, now, you the problem with having a blue ocean idea is that soon people are going to want to compete against you and copy your blue ocean idea. So this this scopability, um, not the scopability, the uh, immobility of your idea is kind of important. If you have trademarks, trade names, copyrighted material, this also helps to try to. Um, the better you can lock down your blue ocean idea from competitors the longer you can maintain a more profitable pricing strategy. So, but that's not going to last forever. And there are this sort of this pricing card or that they talk about where uh, the perfect, you kind of look at the range of prices that can be offered um, for different products and services. And we have, you know, what they call in this, in this corridor, an upper pricing level, which is a higher degree of legal resources and protection. So that means we could price the product at a higher level if we're able to prevent 
through uh, legal and other resource projections, other competitors from moving in. We may adopt the middle mid price level if we have some degree of protection. But then, if competitors can easily, uh, if we have a really low degree of legal or resource protection, and it's easy to imitate a product, we're going to probably want to go more for the lower price segment of the price corridor because this all has to do with the entry of new competitors into our market space. And you know, if we do price the product too aggressively, it's going to just draw more competition to the market as they see it's easy to compete with us on price. So pricing is a strategically a, a, something that's constantly modifying in the blue ocean. So as the product comes out, even you look at you know the, the Nintendo Wii that was priced below the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3, uh, even though it had a superior uh, blue ocean type of product, they still felt that you know. Let's put it at a price point that's much lower uh, because not that it, I guess it wasn't easy to really maintain that competitive advantage of the motion capture because soon uh, the Xbox came out with connects and the PlayStation came out with the move and competed with them. The um, OK, so step one in the price corridor for the masses different form same function so the model t versus the horse drawn carriage the cell phone versus the pay phone you know so if it's you know it's if it's the same serving the same function making a call or getting from point a to point b then you know we have some we have some room to really play with the price uh different forms but same sort of function pencil versus computer spreadsheet versus accounting paper you know, these are just you know, way out there types of forms and functionality. Um, we have to also, you know, look across the strategic groups, the industry, the customers, the non-customers, and try to create a price level that's going to be uh, acceptable to you know all these groups for what you're offering. Okay, so the price level. What's the highest price that you could sell your product at? Now, without encouraging a lot of competition to move in, because the higher, the more profitable your industry is, the more competitors it's going to attract. So, of course, when we talked about the immobility of resources and capabilities and assets in the Kellogg's book, you know, it was really similar, a similar type of landscape here, that if we have more protection and there's less mob mobility of what, uh, what of our strengths, we can have a higher price. If not, then we're going to have to have a lower price um, especially if the you know the fixed costs are high, um, are high, and you need to have a high amount of capacity, or you're working other, um, or you need to have a lot of people using the product in order for it to be valuable, like an eBay or World of Warcraft when it develops. You need a network of people using it to become to create the value of the product, or you know a online dating service or something like that. Okay. As far as target pricing, you know, when we talked about this, we want, of course, the price minus the profit margin equals our target price. So we have an idea of how much money we want to make. Uh, so we, we always want to keep the cost as low as possible to help improve our profits and also make an attractive price. Um, okay, so here are some ways to, to get a target to reach a target cost. One, if you streamline the oper the operations and cost innovation, you know, you try to figure out how can, you know, in the value chain, how can we um, replace raw materials, take out, take out expensive raw materials, replace it with less expensive, eliminate or outsource some low value activities. You know, if it takes, you know, too much money for your highly paid labor force, you know, to package your product, it's better to use an outsourcer. Um, you reduce the number of steps or parts in your product or your operation cycle. Um, whatever you can do to reduce the cost of the manufacturing or assembly of your product. Partnering with other companies. If you have a company that has a very weak sales force, maybe can partner with an existing company that has a very strong sales force. Um, and that happens quite often with a lot of companies where, you know, you may have a great product and a great manufacturing, but you just don't have the distribution of the sales force. Then you partner with another company that does. Um, 
you can change the whole pricing model of the industry, such as instead of selling straight um, DVDs, Blockbuster created the rental. Xerox created the rental of the photocopier or the timeshare with NetJets, NetJets or even the timeshare vacation home. You know, okay, so the, the profit model of the Blue Ocean, you know, you have your strategic price, the price that you feel is the best for the market price, the marketplace that would, that would encourage the most people to buy your product. Then you have the target profit that you want to make. In order to reach that target profit, you have to achieve your target costs. And to get to the target cost, you have to either streamline uh, and produce and develop cost innovations for manufacturing your product or partner with someone to help you reduce those costs and distribute the product. Um, and then you would have your pricing innovation at the end if you're able to fulfill this, this model. Okay, part four, adoption. Now, now how are you going to get people to use your product? There is learning curves, there is fear of change, there are a lot of things involved in getting people to take on your product and adopt it as something they're going to be purchasing on a routine basis. So, um, now, if you develop this Blue Ocean product and you have to communicate to the people involved with the product, employees, business partners, general public, um, the groups that, general, that need to be considered, definitely the employees. You have to communicate to your employees uh, so they can understand the product, what your goals are, how, it's gonna, how, they, how you're going to be able to sell it, manufacture it, and how they can contribute, and what ideas they may have to improve it. You need to communicate with your business partners on what you're doing. An example here is on SAP introduced a new product called AA, ASAP, which was going to reduce the amount of consulting hours needed to implement the product. Its partner uh, was concerned, the partner that actually did the consulting and the implementation of the product. Uh, however, after discussing it openly with their partner who would do the implementation, they were able to get them to understand, like, listen, we may be reducing your overall consulting hours per customer, but this new product will open us up to a whole host of new mid-sized companies, so you'll have more business, not less, from us doing this. And it was a win-win. But if they didn't communicate that with their partner, their partner may have left. Uh, and the general public, you know, you want them to understand what the product is, um, how it's beneficial. You know, for example, a great failure in this is when Montesano made um, genetically modified, genetically altered foods. Uh, they didn't really explain to the the, the your, people buying these foods at the other end um, what they were about and the safety of them and people just labeled them Franken foods and was afraid to even be involved with them uh, okay now uh, let's see okay so we're, we're gonna stop we're not gonna go into chapter 7 the, uh, this is the last slide we're going to go over. Sort of just a, a rehash. The six principles of Blue Ocean Strategy. Um, we want to, uh, we have a formulation of the principles. You know, reconstructing the market boundaries, uh, focusing the big picture, not the numbers, reaching beyond the existing demand, getting this, this, the sequence right, and evaluating uh, the principles, and overcoming you know the organizational hurdles of developing this and executing this new strategy. Uh, the risk factor for each of these principles, you know, um, there can be a, a risk in, you know, everything you do when you're trying to creating a blue ocean, a lot of risks are going to be uh, exposed. And this has to be something that is taken into consideration in your strategy, you know, because there some blue ocean ideas just are too ahead of their time and they just aren't worth the risk for the company to get involved in. Um, you know, and any in adopting any type of this blue ocean strategy, there's going to be organizational and management risk. Is a lot of people will be fail to have an open mind enough to really move into this concept and, and embrace it. So these are just you know sort of a rehash of chapter six. Okay, so we're going to stop here. Just the first six chapters of Blue Ocean, and I'm also going to put up another uh, lecture by another professor from University of San Diego that does a really great job explaining this that you may want to listen to, in addition to reading the book and in addition to listening to the MP3s on the Blue Ocean. Uh, all of these um, 
the media hopefully help to get you closer to this isn't an idea or a construct that you get right away you have to be exposed to it and think about it and absorb this blue ocean uh, strategy um, through a couple of different media so I just want to recommend that you if you have the time to definitely listen to the mp3s read the book watch you know, obviously, hopefully you're at the end of watching my lecture here, but also watch the uh, other lecture I post from uh, the University of San Diego. I think all this will bring you much closer to understanding what the blue ocean is and how it helps you, how it helps a company really transform its offerings and develop a whole new world of profitability and sales and uh, an innovation that really can help propel, propel any company forward. Okay. Thank you.